If you don't know the four different basic ways to touch and be touched, then you're missing out on a rich, sensual experience with your partner and all the different possibilities that can unfold from there. And this week, you're going to learn not only that, but also how getting consent and ensuring that what you do is consensual with your partner can lead to deep, erotic connection between the two of you. But first, I want to start with a little gratitude like I've been doing each week. Relationship Alive couldn't exist without you, and I really appreciate your being here with me each week to talk about the nuances of how to have an amazing, thriving relationship. Now, this week's episode is being brought to you in part by the following fabulous people who have contributed to the podcast. Denise, Kelly, Kent, Sarah, Abe, Renee, Michaela, Neil, CD, and Ruthanna. Thank you so much for your generous support. And if you are finding the podcast to be helpful, please consider a donation to help keep the lights on here at Relationship Alive headquarters. To choose something that feels right for you, just visit neilsatin.com slash support, or you can text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. But first, I want to start with a little gratitude like I've been doing each week. Relationship Alive couldn't exist without you, and I really appreciate your being here with me each week to talk about the nuances of how to have an amazing, thriving relationship. Now, this week's episode is being brought to you in part by the following fabulous people who have contributed to the podcast. Denise, Kelly, Kent, Sarah, Abe, Renee, Michaela, Neil, CD, and Ruthanna, thank you so much for your generous support. And if you are finding the podcast to be helpful, please consider a donation to help keep the lights on here at Relationship Alive headquarters. To choose something that feels right for you, just visit neilsatin.com slash support, or you can text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Before we dive in, there are a couple free resources that I wanted to let you know about. If you haven't yet downloaded my free guide to my top three relationship communication secrets, you can get it by visiting neilsatin.com slash relate or texting the word relate to the number 33444. These are three important ways to shape the way that you communicate so that you can stay connected no matter how challenging the thing is that you're talking about. And this is especially important when you're communicating about touch and sex and how you and your partner play together. The guide is free and will make a difference in how you communicate in all of your relationships. Again, that's neilsatin.com slash relate. Also, if you're on Facebook, come join the Relationship Alive community. There are more than 2,000 listeners gathered there to create a safe space to talk about your relationships. So join us there. And if you're on Instagram, you can follow the Relationship Alive official account that we just started. We don't have a lot there, but we do have a few kind of fun, cool things. And make sure that you follow the official account because there's someone who's actually pretending to be me there on Instagram. (laughs) Okay, I think that is it. So let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. In today's culture, we're talking a lot about how to truly get consent. And it's an interesting conversation because generally, I don't know about you, but I want to ensure that when I'm getting involved with someone and particularly with my partner, that when we are doing anything, but particularly when we're intimate with each other, 
that we're doing things that we both want to be doing, that consent is there. And yet the way that we've learned culturally how to uh, engage in being intimate with other people isn't really about consent. It's kind of about trying to go as far as you can and then letting someone's boundary or lack thereof stop you. And it doesn't work so well, as we've seen, uh, especially recently with all of the the Me Too revelations of, about just how many people are abusing their power and um, and discovering that they've abused their power. Some people know this consciously and other people, it's it's a revelation. So I want to create a context for you where you don't have to wonder, where you know that when you're there with someone, you're, they're right there with you. And at the same time, we want to build consent in a way that actually enhances erotic energy and polarity and passion, where it's not something that that kills the spark and the energy between you and your partner. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm really excited for today's guest. Her name is Betty Martin. And I found out about her when a friend of mine sent her videos on the wheel of consent my way. And I watched them and they were a revelation. So I'm bringing the revelation here to you today with Betty Martin, who's a former chiropractor. And now she's a sex and intimacy coach who is, has worked with clients and is also primarily training other practitioners, um, both people who work hands on, like chiropractors, massage therapists, um, and also people who are just therapists and counselors and coaches, how to bring the wheel of consent into their practice and use it with their clients and also become more aware of how they are interacting with their clients in ways that are generative and beneficial for everyone. Uh, as always, we will have a detailed transcript of today's episode. If you want to get it, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash consent, or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions, and we'll send you a link where you can download that transcript. I think that's it. Uh, Betty Martin, thank you so much for joining us here today on Relationship Alive. You are welcome. Thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure to have you here. And I know a lot more about pleasure now that I've been through <laughs> your your videos. And um, mm. I do want to say you're in the process of, of writing a book. Um, I, is, is it still tentatively titled Learning to Touch? No, it's t- t- that's a great question. You know, book titles tend to change as they get written. Right. Um, but it's tentatively titled The Direction of the Gift, Understanding oh. the Wheel of Consent. Oh, I like that. Well, um, I was hungry. Or it may be The Wheel of Consent, Understanding the Direction of the Gift, either way. The Direction <laughs> of the Gift. And, and you'll know what we're talking about in just a moment. Yeah. I was hungry, hungry for the book. But at the same time, Betty, you're, you have so generously put all these videos on your website that walk people through the process of mm-hmm. exploring the Wheel of Consent. It was so helpful for me. Um, so I encourage you listening once, you know, once you've heard this conversation, you can go back and fill in the gaps somewhat with the videos. And then Betty, when your book comes out, we will devour it here. I'm sure. Thank you. Um, so let's start with maybe a broad question, which is what, what is consent? And, and when you look at the wheel of consent, and of course, we're going to describe the wheel in a moment. What's its contribution to this conversation about what consent even is? That's a great question. Consent in the dictionary is agreeing to something, and it implies that it's something that somebody else wants. So I can consent to you touching me in some way, or I can consent to touching you in some way or doing something for you. Um, so it it implies that there's something that somebody else wants that we are agreeing to. And that's why you say get consent or give consent. Um, 
when I give consent, it means I'm agreeing to something that you want. However, I would like to expand that definition um, and the, the public conversation on consent these days is so rich that it, it, I imagine the definition is already expanding, but I, I would like to expand that definition to be more of an agreement. What is it that we are agreeing to? And an agreement is something, isn't something you give someone, it's something that you arrive at together. So will you scratch my back, honey? Sure. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Now we have an agreement. So that's consent. Or may I feel up your back? Uh, sure. Okay, now we have consent. We have an agreement. Um, so that's how I'd like to expand the, the idea of consent. And there's also people talking, and particularly around um, sexual interaction, there's people talking about informed consent, enthusiastic consent, uh, changeable consent. They're talking about the importance of not just having, um, having permission, but are both people equally delighted and engaged? And I think that's the direction that we want to go. It's not, well, as, as you were describing, it's not, well, well, can I get away with this? It's, is the other person equally delighted and engaged? Mm. Uh, so the, the wheel of consent in particular has a pretty specific contribution, and that is that there's a difference between who is doing, who's got their hands on who, and who it's for. So I could be touching you for your benefit the way you want. I could also be touching you for my benefit the way I want. And the difference between those is significant. And the wheel of consent recognizes that difference, um, which I'll explain after a while, but it recognizes that difference and, sa and, and says that part of consent is whose hands are going where. But another very important part of consent is who is it actually for? Um, so that's the particular contribution that the wheel of consent brings to the conversation about consent. It's, it's not that consent's a good thing. We already know that, and that's very clear. And, you know, it's not that you ought not to touch people without an agreement. Everybody knows that. Um, so the contribution of the wheel is that who it's for uh, ideally is part of the agreement because it makes a difference. Right. Yeah. That was one thing that uh, probably won't surprise you that really uh, my eyes were opened to you just in terms of how you teased apart those two separate dynamics mm -hmm. suddenly opened me up. And especially as we get into talking about the difference between um, the giving receiving mm -hmm. dynamic and the taking allowing dynamic and, and where people tend to find themselves um, I can't wait to to dive in more deeply because that was that, there was just so much that there. That was the ahas. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. So yeah. So where and and I appreciate. It. I think I heard you during the intro, kind of chuckling about that that way that it, it's so bizarre, but it's it's almost like we're taught, whether it's intentionally or not, um, that the way to get consent is to basically keep violating people's boundaries and <laughs> right <laughs> until they smack you one right yeah or they freeze or until up, they give and, up and they do exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah i'm curious let just because i mentioned it in the intro what are your thoughts on people's fears that obtaining that agreement that we're talking about um that that's somehow going to actually kill the erotic energy between two people that if there isn't that kind of like edgy risk happening <laughs> that somehow <laughs> the passion is going to just vanish oh yeah well basically i'd say grow up because erotic tension and charge can be created by polarity of course and one may get really turned on by the polarity of 
the idea of, oh, I'm going to take this thing from this person, whether they want to give it to me or not. And that's understandable, but it doesn't substitute for actually communicating that that's what you want to do and getting this person's uh, agreement. Um, but I think mostly the, the reason people think it kills the mood is because they don't know how. And because, yeah, I just say, grow up, you're grown up, and you don't actually want to do something to someone who doesn't want it done to them. Right. And so you need to learn how to ask. Right. And, uh, and there are a lot of people teaching fun ways to ask. Um, but, and I think it also can be that you assume that in order to have an agreement, we have to make a detailed plan. Like, okay, I'm going to put my hand here and then you're going to put your hand here and then you're going to put your mouth here and then we're going to roll over and then we're going to do this. Like that's not, that is not required. Um, that's not what agreement means, although it could if that's what was helpful for you. Um, yeah, well, I think we'll be able to even pull that apart more as we go into a conversation about the wheel of consent mm -hmm. and, and those moments for where, where and how agreements happen. Um, that might become more obvious for us as we go more deeply. So... Um, Wheel of consent, wheel of consent. We, we keep mentioning it. And as I was thinking about our conversation, I was, part of me was like, how are we going to do this without a, a whiteboard, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for people to really get it? So I think that, you know, if you watch Betty's videos, you'll see it. And I may do a little drawing as we're talking and then kind of post the drawing on, you know, in the show notes of the conversation sure. too. But, um, there's but also a, um, there's a free download on my website that has a diagram of it. Great, great. So we'll, we'll have links to all of that. Yeah. And in the meantime, let's, where, where is a good place to start? Um, you already mentioned this question of maybe the two axes of, um, yeah. and I'm imagining maybe for people at home you ha or in your car, you have a circle and you have one axis that goes up and down and one that goes back and forth across your typical X, Y axis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's start there. And, and you already named each of those, but yeah. yeah. Well, actually I, I want to back up and start with where it came from because I, I think having some context makes the, the model make more sense. Great. And that is that years ago, a couple of decades ago, I was at a workshop uh, by the body electric school and it was called Power, Surrender, and Intimacy. And it was about pl using the play tools of power and surrender and exploring that. So um, uh, BDSM kinds of things and just other ways to play with the experience of power in erotic settings. And one of the games that we played there was called the three-minute game. And it consisted of two questions, and you take turns. You're playing with another person. You take turns asking each other these two questions. And the two questions were, what do you want me to do to you for three minutes? And the other question is, what do you want to do to me for three minutes? And it was a lot of fun. I took it home, and I put it to work with my clients, but I wasn't teaching power. I was teaching touch. So I, I narrowed the question somewhat. So now the question is, how do you want me to touch you for three minutes? And how do you want to touch me for three minutes? And of course you can have longer turns than that. So basically the question is, how do you want me to touch you? And how do you want to touch me? And what surprised me was how difficult it was for people. Because for one thing, you're asking someone what they want. And there are always times we don't know what we want. And many of us have never been asked how we want to be touched. So we have no clue where to start. 
And almost no one has been asked, how do you want to touch me? For some people, it just didn't even make sense at all. It's like, what do you mean, how do I want to touch you? I want to touch you however you want. But that's nice, but that's not the question. The question is, how do you want to touch me? That's for you. That's for your enjoyment. So those two two questions asked by two different people create four rounds of touching. In one round, I'm touching you the way you want. In another round, I'm touching you the way I want. And so I can get to see what that difference is. And in one round, you're touching me the way I want. And in the final round, you're touching me the way you want. And again, I get to feel the difference between those two. So the wheel of consent simply draws out on those axes that you're describing, draws out, oh, in, in two of those examples, I'm doing, and in two of them, I'm being done to. And in two of them, it's for me, and in two of them, it's for you. And those two cross, and so you have four quadrants. I'm doing what I want, I'm doing what you want, you're doing what I want, you're doing what you want. Um, So the wheel of consent is really simply a diagram of what happens when two people ask each other those two questions. That's all it is. It's really simple. Um, And it, it distinguishes who is doing from who it's for. There's a free download on my website that you can download it and draw it out and, you know, all that. And each of those quadrants has a name. But the important thing to know is that who is doing is not always the same as who it's for. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's a great distinction. And and I love how you integrated that into what we know about how we experience pleasure. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you mentioned that like, well, I... I just want to do whatever you want and how so many people have this indirect experience mm-hmm. of their own pleasure that the their only access to their own pleasure is through someone else's pleasure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, so I'm maybe we could just take a moment too and talk about the first lesson that you offer on your site and why that's so important. I think you even talk about how introducing that transformed Mm -hmm. people's experience of the three minute game. Yeah. 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 What, when I, when I began doing with this, this with clients and I would ask them, how do you want to touch me? For example, and they, and it may be, you know, I want to feel your arm or something. And I would try to coach them in touching for their own pleasure Feel the shape, feel the warmth, feel the texture of the skin, feel, you know, the shape of it. Like, focus on what you are noticing with your hands and what you are enjoying directly from the touch itself. Not from what effect it has on me, but from how it feels in your own hands. And I found that that was surprisingly difficult for people. And... um and one day, I, there was a, I had a client for whom it was extremely difficult. He just could not pull himself away from trying to, to produce some effect on me. And I reached over. There was a, happened to be a river stone sitting on the counter. And I, I thought to myself, okay, buddy, let's see what happens if there's nobody to give to. And I handed <laughs> him this river stone. I didn't say that out loud, but I was thinking that handed him this stone, and I said, so see if you can feel this, you know, for your own enjoyment. And he couldn't do that either. He just could not connect with his hands. And that was a big aha for me of that it's not that he was having trouble feeling a person. He was having trouble feeling anything with his hands. Mm. 
And so, um, so after that, I began to do that experiment with people of, okay, feel this object, and then it'll sort of wake up the ability of your hands to experience sensation as pleasure. And then you transfer that over into feeling a, a person, a, a body, you know. And these sessions were clothed, so we were using mainly, mainly hands and arms. Um, and so, so I gradually learned that, oh, that just doesn't apply to everybody who has trouble. It applies to everybody. Yeah. And so I began offering this little exercise to everybody. And, it, and like you said, it's, it's on the website. Um, that, and it, it, it still amazes me how transformative it often is for people to you you just lean back in your chair or your seat and you take something into your lap some inanimate object a pen or a shell or a hairbrush and you just feel it what does it feel like where are the bumps where is it smooth where is it sharp and if you feel it slowly enough and that's the that's the key right there is moving your hands really slowly. You'll start to notice that, oh, oh, this is quite interesting. That It's bumpy over here. Oh, it's smooth over here. And, oh, this is kind of pleasant. And then pretty soon you notice that, oh, it's, it's pleasurable. And then you start to, instead of feeling the object for its characteristics, pretty soon you're using the object as a way to in experience pleasure in your hands. So it kind of shifts from your focus on the object shifts to your focus is on your hands and what feels pleasant to your hands. And then pretty soon you're just using the shell as an object to pleasure yourself. And that is, uh, it takes a little, takes a few minutes to click for most people. Many people it takes 10 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes. For some people it's extremely difficult and I've had people that I've sent home and sent five minutes a day for six weeks and then come back um, because our what we're doing is we're getting this brain cell to talk to this other brain cell. And if they haven't talked in a quite a while, it can be difficult. And the surprising thing is that very often there's an emotional response to those brain cells starting to talk to each other because what we're what you're really playing with here is what's your relationship to your skin? It's really, really a fundamental piece. Um, are you able to notice sensation in your skin and are you able to experience that as pleasure? And when you do, very often feelings will come up. Embarrassment, shame, guilt. It's interesting what will come up. Um, grief is very common as well as delight and surprise and, oh my gosh, I didn't know I could feel this much and this is wonderful. There's a quite a range of feelings that have come up. Um, and they, they are showing you your relationship to pleasure and your relationship to your skin. Um, because there's no other person involved. You're not giving somebody pleasure. You're, no one's giving you pleasure. No one's doing anything to you. No, there's no one you can blame if it doesn't feel good. <laughs> like it's just you and your skin. Um, and so, yeah, that, that turned out to be a really fundamental piece that I had no idea was there until I stumbled on it. Yeah. And you mentioned, which is so important, just that awareness that your hands have such a high concentration mm -hmm. of nerve endings. Yes. Like second yeah. only to what your mouth and your genitals basically. Yeah. Yeah. So um so there's a huge capacity for receiving pleasure. Yeah. When you get past what we usually do with our hands, which is more as a as a way of manipulating things or yeah. um or work, work, work. Right. Or you get that the sensation like, oh, that's sharp, that's wet, that's cold, those sorts of yeah. things. But you're not actually yeah. allowing that sensation to expand into actual pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what this does is yeah. then it, when, when your hands are awake 
and your hands are able to take in pleasure of sensation, then when you touch a person, then you're able to touch a person for your own pleasure because your hands know how to experience pleasure. So you can, you know, run your hand down their back or their leg or something and you feel the shapes, you feel the textures, you feel the warmth, you know, you feel the contour and it's very enjoyable just, you know, right there in your hands. And, um, and then it becomes possible to touch someone for your own enjoyment, which is one of the quadrants. It's how do you want to touch me? Well, uh, may I feel your legs? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, how do you want to touch me? Um, can I play with your hair? Yeah, sure, but don't pull it. How do you want to touch me? Can I feel up your back? Yeah, but I'm going to keep my shirt on. Okay. So it, it's, it, then you can use your hands to feel a person. Actually, you're feeling somebody up. So what you're doing and you're getting consent for it first. Right. So the consent is not just having my hands on your back. It's having your hands on my back for my pleasure, which is very different from having my hands on your back to give you a back massage. Right. So that's where the distinction comes in, and it turns out to be very rich. Yeah, and okay, so first let's step back for just a minute because there is one comment that you made very quickly, but if when I heard it originally, it felt so important to me, mm-hmm. which um, when you were describing how to use um, an inanimate object, how to just feel it with your hands mm-hmm. and to and to feel the pleasure in your hands. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned leaning back. Mm. And so I'm wondering if you can talk for a moment about the importance of leaning back and and not efforting when it comes to Mm -hmm. experiencing pleasure. Yeah, boy, that's a good one. I'm not sure why, but I just noticed it in doing this with hundreds of people that when you lean back um, and put, take this object into your lap, that it makes available to you an experience of being attentive to the pleasure that doesn't happen. It just doesn't click if you're leaning forward or turned to the side or holding the object up in the air I'm assuming that it's because you have the muscles of your trunk engaged and that, you know, wakes up a different part of your brain. I'm not real sure. But I just know that I've seen it with hundreds of people. Um, And there's, you know, if you were an, if you were an ambulance driver and you came upon an accident and you had to reach through the twisted up glass in order to take somebody's pulse, you know, you could take in that data with your hands, no problem. But if you, but if you are sort of contorting yourself or holding yourself forward or turned around, you're not going to be able to relax into the sensation of it very easily. Um, and we're, what we're looking for is, for the sensation to become pleasurable. Right. And as the sensation becomes pleasurable, it can build and build. I think you say it, yeah. it, it recruits more it, and more it, yeah. brain activity yes. to yeah. support the pleasure. Yes. And that, that does happen. You, you put your attention on something, you actually recruit more and more brain cells in, a, in attending to that thing. And, you know, we're talking about sensation. So you attend to your sensation, more and more brain cells are going to be recruited to attend to it. So it has this feeling, the feeling of it is that sort of fills up, fills you up, fills up the space. The world drops away is the feeling of it. Yeah. And the sensation becomes very large. Yeah. And so that... Um, seems so important to me because so many couples who are having issues around their intimacy 
Yeah. Um, they, one or the other of them, or maybe both, gets trapped in the sense of like, oh, well, I should, like, this should feel good to me. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to somehow make it feel good. Or yeah. I should want this for my partner. Yes. or And yeah. so that level of efforting is so different than relaxing mm -hmm. into sensation. And you mm -hmm. use the term following the pleasure mm -hmm. and trusting where that pleasure mm -hmm. is going to take you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one thing that happens, so I call what we're describing here the ability to attend to the sensation and ex experience it as pleasure. I'm calling that the direct route of pleasure. It just comes in, the nerve endings in your hands are stimulated, it goes right up your spinal cord into your brain, bing, lights up your pleasure center. It's a direct route. There's also the indirect route, which is, I do something to you, and you smile, and then your smile lights me up. So it's like throwing out a boomerang. I've got to catch something in order to experience pleasure. And that's what I call uh, the indirect route. So the indirect route depends on you responding in some way that I like, or I don't have anything. If the direct route is closed, and I have to get you excited in order for me to enjoy it. Now I'm depending on you, and I'm depending on you responding in the way that I want you to respond, or I have nothing. And this is where, <laughs> this is a problem. Because now, it's uh, the now I'm not really giving to you, I'm using you to get the response that I want to see so that I can feel good about myself and so that I can have some pleasure. This is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And we've probably all been there. I've been there. I've been on both ends of it and I don't recommend it, but it, it's where many people are stuck because they don't really know what else to do. Right. And this is why each of the quadrants in the wheel of consent is so important. Mm -hmm. You talk about how important it is to, to experience each one on its own, that if mm -hmm. you're in like the gray zone between like, oh, I'm, I'm giving to you for my pleasure, but I'm actually waiting for you to receive something in order to, to mm -hmm. actually get pleasure. Well, now you're not really experiencing yeah. either of those yeah, things. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing the quadrants showed me after a while was that in order to experience each of them, you have to take them apart. So when I'm touching you for me, it needs to be 100% for me. I'm still uh, within consent and I'm uh, abiding by whatever limits you've set, and I'm respecting your limits. I'm not just doing any darn thing I want to do. I've asked you, may I do this? And you've said yes, and we've negotiated limits. But but it's 100% for me. I'm not trying to get a response out of you, and I'm not trying to please you. So there's that quadrant. And then the other quadrant, I'm doing it, and it's 100% it's for you. Again, I'm abiding by my limits. I'm respecting my limits. Well, I'm available to do this, but I'm not available to do that. And you are also respecting my limits. But it's 100% for you. It's not about me. It's not about what I want to do. It's about what you want me to do. And so the distinction between those two, when you can take them apart and you can be in completely in one or completely in the other, that's when they get really, really rich. And that's where you have your big ahas. That's where you have your challenges. That's where you see, oh, this is what I was doing that I wasn't very clean about. Or, oh my gosh, this is what has been locked away and now it's free and opened up. Or lots and lots of insights come when you can take the quadrants apart and experience them one at a time. And that's what the that's what the wheel is. It's really, it's a practice in taking, receiving, and giving apart. So you're doing one of them at a time. It's not the way I would want to live my entire love life, certainly. It's a practice in 
can I completely receive, it's all about me, or can I completely give and it's all about them, and can I tell the difference? And when I can tell the difference, then they both become very rich. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was a question for me around, like in the end, when you tease them apart through the practice, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you're able to dance between them, I imagine. Yes. Yeah. 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 Everyone thinks they're jump, they're dancing in between them and doing them all at once, but really they're not doing any of them. Until you can take them apart, you can't do any of them. Yeah, great. Yeah. Betty, I need to pause for just a moment to talk about this week's sponsor. And I'm excited, not only because they're great at doing what they do and making your life a little bit easier, but also because they're offering something special for you as a Relationship Alive listener if you wear contact lenses, like I do. Their name is simplecontacts.com, and they're offering $20 off your first order with them if you visit simplecontacts.com slash alive20, that's the word alive and then the number 20, or use the coupon code alive20 when you check out. Now, simplecontacts.com has made it really easy, not only to get your supply of contact lenses, and they carry all major brands, but also to get your prescription renewed if you need to do that. They've created this vision test that you can take in the comfort of your own home in less than five minutes, and it only costs $20, which is a huge bargain compared to whatever a visit to the eye doctor might cost you. Now, it's not meant to replace a full eye health exam, but it is a way to get a doctor-approved prescription renewal without having to leave the comfort of your own home or office or wherever you happen to be. With them, standard shipping is free, and on top of that, they have stellar customer service, which I got to put to the test, because I actually have a somewhat rare condition that keeps me from being able to turn my eyes It's called Duane's Retraction Syndrome, if you want to do a little Googling. And as you might imagine, part of the quick and easy vision test requires that you turn your eyes left and right, which sounds simple enough, right? But that's not something that I can do. So in any case, I took the test the best that I could. I placed my order and I waited to see what would happen, if anyone would notice. Sure enough, I got a text right away from their customer support people who were super personable, and they told me that I needed to retake the turning your eyes portion of the test. I explained my situation to them, the condition that I have, and after consulting with their doctors, they just told me that I was all set, and it was as easy as that. So I use contacts when I dance or go to the beach, and I'm really psyched to have a reliable source when my supply is running low. So the whole process with simplecontacts.com, as I mentioned, was really easy, fast, and I am delighted to be able to offer you $20 off your first order to try them out. All you have to do is visit simplecontacts.com slash alive20, that's the word alive and the number 20, or use the coupon code alive20 at checkout to get your discount. Thank you, Simple Contacts, for a sweet deal for Relationship Alive listeners and for helping make Relationship Alive possible. And now let's get back to our conversation with Betty Martin. So let's yeah. go a little bit deeper. And I'm, I want to start, if it's okay, with, so we talked about a moment ago giving, which is I'm touching you and I'm touching you the way you want to be touched. Like I'm touching you for you. Mm-hmm. I'm the giver. And oh, thank you. you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and on the on the opposite quadrant from that is the receiver, the person mm-hmm. who's being done to and they are receiving the pleasure. And mm-hmm. I think you do mention too that pleasure is like there it's not the sole province of one or two quadrants. Like no matter where you are here, right. you can be feeling pleasure. You can be feeling yeah. pleasure as a giver. But the idea is that if you're giving, so I'm, I'm, I'm touching you to um, the way you want to be touched, and then you mm-hmm. are just receiving that touch, mm-hmm. um, receiving touch the way you want to be touched. Mm-hmm. Um, and you mentioned that a lot of couples 
get stuck there in mm-hmm. that in that part of the of the wheel. It's like their their only access point to touching each other is is giving and receiving mm-hmm. in that mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Well, I think we need to back up and define receive and give. Great. Um, because if if you're if you're looking at the the diagram, you'll see this. But receive and give have a couple of different meanings. Receive, for example, one meaning is that something comes towards me and arrives at me, so I can receive um, a package in the mail, I can receive a pass to the 20 yard line, I can receive a massage, but I can also receive a punch in the jaw and a branch falling on my head, you know, so that meaning of receive means something is done to me, it doesn't mean that I want it, you can receive unwanted touch, right, so that definition of receive means something's done to me, doesn't mean I want it or not. Just is not applicable there. Right. The other meaning of receive means it's a gift for me and it's something that I do want. But the the trouble now is that, well, maybe what I want is to be touched, which is what you were describing, touch me the way I want. Or maybe what I want is to be allowed to touch you in the way that I want. So it so this definition of receive doesn't indicate who is doing. It indicates who it's for. So when, when you are allowing me to touch you the way I want and feel you up the way I want, now you are giving me the gift. I'm receiving the gift, but I'm the one who's doing. So have I got your brains all tangled up yeah hopefully not but i but you just filled in the the fourth quadrant yeah. of the diagram for me so. yeah 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 so receive and give i'm using in a very particular way here and i realize it's not the way that everybody uses it i'm using it to mean not who's doing i'm using it to mean who it's for and and this does fill in the other two quadrants this is the quadrant of I'm doing what I want to do to you, and you are allowing me to do that. So the action's going from me to you, but the gift is going from you to me. You are giving me this gift of access to your body for me to enjoy the way I want to enjoy it. Right. So and the, that's, and- why, that's why the two um, uh, axes on the diagram, one is who's doing and who's being done to, the other is who's giving and who's receiving or who is it for. Yeah. 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 And People trip over that and that's fine. And I realize it's not the way everybody uses the word. Uh, and in the workshops that I teach and when I work with clients, people will trip over it for a while and that's okay. It, it'll, it'll come around. So, and when you, you make the distinction, and this is great, that, that each of these quadrants also has a shadow side. And yes. so you draw the circle and it's like everything that happens within that circle, that's, those are the things that you're in agreement about, that you're yes. consenting to. I want to touch you this way and you, and, and I'm explicit about that. And you, mm-hmm. you agree, you, you allow mm-hmm. me. Um, Mm -hmm. And that could be that you want me to, or it could be that you're willing to Mm -hmm. let me touch you that way. Um, And that outside of the circle, those are the things where these things happen, but where you don't have consent. That's Um, right. And that each of these quadrants has a sort of a a shadow expression. So in the, Mm. and I think, um, you know, in the taking allowing that we were just describing. So taking Mm -hmm. being, I'm touching you the way I want to touch you and allowing mm-hmm. being, I'll let you do that. Well, it's yeah. obvious where that leads when you don't have consent. Yes. Well, it may be obvious and it may not because the um, if you expand the view of this dynamic beyond my hands on you, then you you realize that, well, the shadow of, 
for, for example, the take allow dynamic, the shadow is groping or using or um, assault, rape, murder, and war. And the shadow of it also is dropping bombs on civilian populations, well, any populations, in order to get their oil from the land in there, from under their sand, you know, or to, um, to go into a country and prop up the petty dictator so that we can get cheap bananas. You know, that is part of the shadow of the taking quadrant. I'm taking action that I want to take, but I haven't asked you if it's okay with you. I'm reaching out to get something that I want, but you mm -hmm. haven't given me consent. Yeah. So the, the shadow of the taking quadrant in particular is really ugly. And our whole culture is built on it. Right. We, we stole the land. I'm, I'm in America. I don't know where you are, but, you know, we stole the land and we kill all the people, a bunch of the people. And that's a shadow of the taking quadrant if ever there was one. You know, so so that's what that's where I actually get passionate about this stuff is that, you know, it will improve your sex life. Great. But I don't actually care. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm, <laughs> Betty, I'm this really, is what we're here to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm really interested in is how does it make you more aware of where you are in consent and where you are out of consent? That's what really excites me, because that translates into our lives in the world. And it, as it happens, it seems to happen anyway, that when we experience something somatically in our bodies, right here in our homes with our partners, and we learn that we have a choice about what happens to us, we learn that there are things that we want to do that we need permission for, we learn these things in a very tangible, physical way. And then they become real to us. And then we see where they, how they apply in the rest of our lives. Yeah. We start to see, oh, this is where I've been a doormat. I didn't notice that until now. Now I see it. Or this is where I have been taking advantage of people. Oh, I didn't see it before now. Now I see it. This is where I've been giving, giving, giving way more than I really felt good about. Oh, I didn't see it before. Well, now I see it. So these are all. This is what excites me about the wheel, actually. Yeah. Right. So you were just basically naming some of that shadow dysfunction mm -hmm. in the other quadrants as well. Yeah. 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 The shadow of the allow quadrant is the doormat, the going along with everything, the putting up with everything, the, the victim, um, the actual victim, not like victim mentality, but you get held up at gunpoint on the street, that's, you're a victim, um, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and in particular, this, like one of the places where this lit up for me, and, and I'm so curious to hear your thoughts on this, is that, um, you know, on the show, we've talked a bunch about overcoming trauma mm -hmm. and how many people have experienced trauma around the, the sexual circuit. Mm -hmm. So that's the shadow of this taking allowing is that's where, yeah. that's where people experience that trauma. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, they're there on the, on the, on the wheel. It's not like, okay, well, taking and allowing are bad. They're just bad when they're happening without consent. Right. And so I'm curious from your perspective, I, what I see happening, and maybe you see this differently, is that when people um, disown the, the taking and allowing dynamic, then that's one time or one place where they get stuck in giving and receiving. And I'm wondering, particularly with people who have experienced the more distorted parts of taking and allowing, how do you encourage them to experience taking and allowing in a way that's based around consent and that's safe? And I'm speculating here from hearing your work that it's actually really important for them to re-own that in a, in a healthy, functional way. 
Um, yeah. So maybe you could talk about if you agree, like why that's important to do, and then maybe how someone who's stuck in one place could mm -hmm. could find a comfortable way back to mm -hmm. taking and allowing that actually serves them and doesn't re-traumatize them. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, I think every person needs access to all four quadrants because each of them is an inherent part of being a human. To, to take action for our own benefit that's part of being human. That's the taking quadrant. And to do so within consent, that's integrity and maturity. And, so, and we need to be able to do that. A, a life in which you cannot take action for your own benefit is going to be pretty problematic. Yeah. Taking action for someone else's benefit, this is the serving quadrant, this is doing what someone else wants you to do. We all need to be able to access that ability to serve others. Of course we do. And we need to learn to do it in a way that respects our own limits and boundaries. Um, so those are basic human abilities that we all need. We all need to learn how to allow others to do things for themselves, even if they affect us, and learn how to set limits that affect us. I'm willing to allow you to do this, but I'm not willing to allow you to do that. Um, that's a basic human skill that we all need. And the fourth quarter, accepting where you're doing what I want. Um, to receive the benefit of other people's actions, that's something that we all do. And, and we need to do it in an in a way that has integrity and clarity and respects other people's boundaries. Um, so they're all basic, they're all inherent to being a human being and we need access to all of them. And when we don't have access to them, we figure out some kind of workaround, but it's often problematic. The, right. the trauma piece I think is really important too, because we have all, been touched against our will, every one of us. And it happened before we could talk. Even in the very best, if you had perfect parents, you still got your nappies changed and your teeth brushed and you got picked up out of oncoming traffic. You know, like you, you were touched in ways that you did not want. And because it, it's pre-verbal, we come out of it with this, our bodies kind of believing that, well, touch is just something that happens that I can't stop, and I just have to make the best of it somehow. That the, the touch itself is not changeable. I have to change myself to, to be okay with it somehow. And for some of us, uh, you know, this happened um, – in a reasonable way and it was gentle and you know, it's okay. And for some of us, it was horrible and traumatic. And most of us are in between there somewhere, but we've all been touched against our will. And so what, what I've come to appreciate through playing this game and working with clients over a dozen years is that what we need to re recover and reclaim is our ability to have a choice about how we are touched. Our ability to have a choice about how we are touched. And that is, uh, it, there's a huge range in that. So there's a huge range in our comfort with being touched. And, and you, you know, you're asking, we're talking about the take allow dynamic and wanting to recover that. And for someone who's been touched a lot against their will or, or traumatically against their will, when you ask them, well, how is, you know, may I feel you're this or that, it's terrifying because they don't quite know that they have a choice about it. And I've, I've seen this working with clients a lot where they just like, oh, I, I get to have a choice about that? Gosh, that never occurred to me, you know. So what I actually suggest is that you start with how do you want me to touch you 
And so you are directing exactly where my hands go moment by moment by moment until you learn that you really do, that you really are in charge of how you're touched. So for someone who's, who's had traumatic experiences, this, this is the place to start that you get to decide if and when and how I touch you and you get to decide moment by moment by moment. Um, so that there's no opportunity for you to go into the going along with putting up with freezing and so forth. And that turns out to be very, very empowering and is life changing for many people. Right. And that could still happen in the context of, you know, if your partner is in the taking role, mm-hmm. then they could mm-hmm. say, I, you know, may I touch your hand. That's one that uh-huh. we use. So, yeah. so they're yeah. expressing that I want to touch your hand for my own pleasure. Mm-hmm. And you could still set you the could limits still and direct yes. exactly how they're, how they're able yeah. to touch your hand. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, one little note on that too, you were, you talk about the principles that each quadrant embodies mm-hmm. um, with the if I get these wrong, feel free to correct me. But I believe that with the giving quadrant, um, this is where I'm giving you what you want for you, um, that that's generosity. That's the serving quadrant. The serving quadrant, Mm -hmm. great. Yeah. And then- Yeah, a lot of people call that giving, but allowing is also a form of giving. Great. So that's why I call it serving. I like that, thank you. Um, The taking quadrant, um, is integrity. You mentioned that. It's about knowing what you want and, and being okay with, with asking, with acting um, in your own interest. Um, the receiving, now there's pro- what's... Accept, there's, accepting. Accepting, thank you. Yeah. So the accepting quadrant, which is, right, because you're receiving the gift that's being get, given or served upon you, I guess. Yeah, you're, you're being touched the way you want. <laughs> yes, so that would be <laughs> gratitude. Yeah. Um, accepting those gifts. Um, and just a reminder that when we were talking about the taking quadrant, that you are receiving there too. You're receiving the, right. the gift of someone allowing you to yes. touch them. And yeah. now when we get into the allowing quadrant, if I'm remembering right, the the principle there is surrender. Yes. Yeah. What's so important about surrender and learning to access that? Well, it's very fun, for one thing. Um, and the other thing is, as you learn to take responsibility for your own limits, and this is something that we're all learning, It's it, there's no one who's totally got it. Like, everybody is on a learning journey here. That to the degree that I learn to say, yes, you can do this to me, but you cannot do this to me, then I become trustworthy to myself. Oh, then I can trust myself. And then I can relax and allow you to, you know, play with me however you want. But that is is based on me gaining the skills to set a limit or to say no, or to say stop, or to say I've changed my mind, or to say, ouch, I need to move over here, or I need to turn over, or, you know, to the degree that I am able to speak up for myself, to that degree, I can enjoy surrendering to you, because I'm, that means I'm no longer micromanaging what happens. I can relax into you taking your pleasure with me, but it depends on me being able to speak up for myself. The idea, there's this idea that, oh, well, you should be able to surrender more, and you, and that's a terrible idea. <laughs> because what that means is, or what that implies is, you should be able to ignore yourself and go along with any old thing that I want to do, and that is not true. That's the opposite, that... As I learn to speak up for myself, then I will naturally and easily surrender and it'll be joy because I can trust that if I need to, I will speak up. And I, again, that's a lifelong journey that we're all on. 
Right. And that's about creating a context in this situation that we're talking about, creating a context with your partner mm -hmm. where you're in, you're creating agreement. It's where we mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of that agreement is you being able to establish the limits within which you're comfortable yes. surrendering. Yes. Yeah, the question is not, well, why can't I surrender to this thing? The question to ask yourself is, within what particular limits would it be fun to surrender? Mm -hmm. And there are some limits, and you'll just, you know, you, you, you wait until you notice what they are. Oh, I'm happy to surrender if I'm assured that you're that I'm going to keep my clothes on, for example. Or I'm happy to surrender my hand and my arm. You can do whatever you want. Or I'm happy to surrender my little finger for three minutes. You know, there is some limit within which surrender is easy, and that's what you want to find, because then that's where you learn to trust yourself, and then as you trust yourself. Your, your limits will gradually expand naturally because you trust yourself to speak up as you need to. Now, we've spent yeah. a lot of time on taking and allowing. I think because that's, they both represent distinctions that mm -hmm. aren't familiar to yeah. a lot of people, myself included. So I'm, I'm glad that we spent a lot of time there. And before we go, I'm wondering if we can just turn our attention briefly to the giving and or the serving and accepting dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Because I don't want to neglect their importance. <laughs> <laughs> They're also really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The accepting, which means I'm being touched the way I want. Um, because of what I mentioned a few minutes ago that we've all been touched against our will and our tendency will be to try to go along with whatever's being done to us and think that we should like it better. This is probably the biggest challenge in the accepting quadrant is, well, they're touching me this way, so therefore I should like it and I should be okay with it. And there's some, if I don't like it, there's something wrong with me. That's backwards. Instead of changing ourselves to suit what's happening, we need to change what's happening to suit ourselves. So part of the, oftentimes the hardest part of the accepting quadrant is asking for what you want, asking for how you want to be touched. Because it's vulnerable, of course it is. And we don't always know. So then we have to just wait a while until we do know. And that can be awkward. And, you know, I, I, uh, I do have compassion for that. But there is no substitute to waiting till you notice what you want and then asking for it um, because then you have the opportunity to receive it. And then you notice that it actually is for you and instead of sort of putting up with whatever is going on, whatever it is that's happening. That's probably the hardest part of the accepting quadrant. And then the, the, the enjoyment of it, if you if you have asked for what you want, the enjoyment of it is pretty automatic. If you're not enjoying it, then he's not. Don't try to change your enjoyment of it. Change what it is that is happening. So the the question to ask is not why aren't I enjoying this more. The question to ask is well, what is it that I actually do want? So that's the question of the accepting quadrant. In the serving quadrant, the hardest part, you might think that the thing to do in serving is to get all sorts of good strokes and techniques down. But what's actually the mo most important part of the serving quadrant is finding out what the, the accepting partner actually wants. And that's a whole art form of waiting and being uh, creating space for them and not pushing them and um, uh not making suggestions and just asking them what they want and then just shut up and wait until they tell you, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's so easy in serving to think, well, I have this cool thing I know how to do, so I'm going to do it. And it's, I, you know, they showed it on the video. It looked pretty cool. Um, 
but that's not really it. It's finding out what they actually want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. If only we could just eliminate so many of those videos that seem to suggest <laughs> <laughs> what people want and oh, that are just yeah. so inaccurate. Yeah. Well, they were accurate for some person at some moment, but you're a different person and it's a different moment. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. One thing that stood out really big for me was that you you mentioned that a lot of most people assume that they're they're on the uh, on the giving side of the wheel. Yeah. yeah. Um, which translates into someone either always maybe always feeling like they're serving and someone always feeling yeah. like they're allowing. Yeah. Um yeah, when when we are on the giving half of the wheel, this is serving and allowing, as you said, we are, the, the nature of giving is that we set aside what we would prefer in order to go with what our partner prefers. At the same time, we are responsible, we're responsible for our boundaries and limits. So as soon as you set aside what you prefer, you're going to feel like you're giving. And so if you are constantly setting aside what you want, you're going to think you're giving all the time. And you kind of are, except that no one has actually asked for that thing or you haven't asked them if they wanted it. So what typically happens in a heterosexual couple is that the man feels like he's in the serving quadrant because he's doing all the work and he's doing all the stuff that he saw in the video and by golly, it's supposed to be for her, and I hope she likes it. Yeah, so he feels like he's serving. And the woman feels like she's allowing because, well, he's doing all the stuff I guess he wants to do. He didn't ask me what I wanted, and I guess he likes doing it, so I'm going to let him do it. So he's in serving. She's in allowing. Who's receiving there? Nobody. Nobody. When I do this in a room full of people, it's a, most everybody nods their heads. They recognize it because, yeah. and I've been there. I've been on both sides of that equation. You know, I think we all have. Um, it's, it's um, I think we have to be able to kind of laugh at ourselves of how did we get here, you know. Um, but that's that's one of the things that happens when you don't get up the courage to talk about what it is that you actually enjoy. And most people recommend that you have this conversation before you get to the bedroom. Mm. That you, in the heat of the moment, it's much harder to communicate. Of course it is. That's much more helpful to have these conversations before you ever get to the bedroom. Um, right, with, uh, the, with the yeah. caveat that once you're in the bedroom, you can still set a limit. But, that you Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And I would just reiterate again that th that the the two questions, the three minute game, the wheel of consent, are a practice. It's something that you come back to again and again, and you see how how clear can I be about who this is for. Um, it's it's not necessarily how you want to live your whole life, but it will illuminate other aspects of how you live your life. It's a practice in, can I just receive or can I just give and can I tell the difference and can I be clear about it and what happens when I do that? So it, it's a practice. Mm. Yeah. And what I love about this as a practice is I think it creates a really um, – easy to follow path to mm -hmm. to relearning mm -hmm. who what you do want yes and and to relearning your partner and what they want mm -hmm. um that's so much of what we're struggling against in relationship is just like the patterning that yes. of how we've done it time yeah. and again with other people etc right. right um and uh yeah so the way that this opens us up to more presence more of a what can happen in this moment? What is actually true in this moment? 
yeah. um, then yeah. and and then that's where the the art of intimacy happens is you learn yeah. these new structures these new ways of interacting and then it becomes yeah. how you how you um, it's just part of your language at that point then yeah. you can get creative and write poetry yeah exactly <laughs> Well, Betty, yeah, one thing. The, the great thing, too, is that when when you take turns asking each other those questions, you start to notice that, oh, what I want now is different than what I wanted yesterday. Mm. What I want now is different than what I wanted five minutes ago. And that's a pretty important thing to notice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I'm just, you know, so many people feel pressed for time. I think obviously if you could do the true three minute game where you get three minutes, then three mm -hmm. minutes, then three minutes and three minutes. So it's actually more like a, a 12 minute game, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, who doesn't have 15 minutes in their day? Come on. Like yeah. you, you could do exactly. that. You know, yeah. you have, you each have a round and then there's a bonus round. Um, yeah. but even if you only had one minute each and yeah. you just sat at the table, that's yeah. possible. Exactly. Um, exactly. One thing that I thought as as I was going through your work was, oh my God, I, w I wish I could do a whole series with you. But the <laughs> the beauty is your series is there on your website. So if if this has piqued your interest, um, I definitely encourage you to check out uh, Betty's website, bettymartin.org. Um, she has everything spelled out different lessons you can follow right along there's uh, plenty of material there for you um and betty looking forward to your book coming out when it does i will make sure to let everyone know so that they can pick it up thank um, you and um i'm just so appreciative of the work that you're doing in the world and um and how you're helping us have this conversation in a way that that leads us somewhere different and the impact that that's going to have not only on our relationships, but on those larger world dynamics feels really powerful to me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.